it's damn near an hour long. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't. <laughs> oh, God. I gotta talk about something in the meantime, though. Is this a horror movie? Mm. How unpleasant. This is really Kyokai no Kanata is a classic I love to go back and watch from time to time. And yet, I rarely talk about it. I've talked about Recreators as my favorite anime before, and I've mentioned multiple times my likes and dislikes both in and around Persona. Even The Great Pretender was the first anime that kicked these videos off with me talking about why I love original anime so much. But regardless, when it comes to stories around characters with tragic backstories, rom-coms, the supernatural, and even certain tropes and cliches that many people have criticized in the past, Kyokai no Kanata is one of those stories that honestly does a lot right. The story centers around Yomu, which are basically demons, and spirit world warriors, as both side combatants and even allies to one another. In the midst of this is Mirai Kuriyama, a glasses-wearing combatant that also utilizes their own blood like acid and Akihito Kambara, an immortal Demi-Yomu who's a proud degenerate for girls in glasses. If you've seen any typical story around enemies with an ongoing battle, polar opposites, so on and so forth, you could probably guess where this all goes on some level. And you'd probably be right. Something I enjoy about this story is that it never feels like it's trying to break new ground or be the new insert blank here, but rather just doing its own thing. Specific to society, yeah, this story isn't anything new. Two people on opposing sides fight one another, eventually learn more about one another, and eventually things escalate to the point of them being together. It's a song and dance that's been around for a long while. So instead of repeating all of that shit, let's talk about what I think this series actually does well. If not better than a lot of stories in the same genre, especially in anime and manga. When it comes to characters, this series actually does a pretty good job of dividing life connections between work. Akihito is a half-yomu, to which, in the prologue, they showcased how much of a danger he can actually be, alongside his actual character being just, well, a decent kid. Throughout the series, especially in the beginning, we see how many people converse with him and are even close to him in some ways. However, when the series shows his control waning and him going berserk, it's evident that the people who he socialized with are actually not just willing to see him as an enemy. They're prepared for it. Most series I can think of usually tend to go down the route of those same people trying to bring them back to their senses, but this series on the other hand makes it pretty evident that even with certain warriors and Yomu being on the same sides, they are also opposing forces. But at the same time, their exact same enemies are those who are willing to work with one another. In its own way, it's pretty remarkable how people from different backgrounds are not all the same. Oh, this show actually points that out. Most of the characters fall under archetypes and tropes, but are also written in ways that actually make them feel like those archetypes don't make up their whole characters. Or in other words, the archetypes, tropes, are combined with people who've touched grass. Let me explain. Akihito is a pervert. In any other series, this would be played up to a disgusting standard. And because he's good looking, any other series and audience for that matter would have let him get away with it just because he's strong too. It's nothing new, just about everybody who said as much is tired of the pervert trope. However, what I like about the series is that Akihito's fetish of girls wearing glasses is not borderline predatory. Desperate, sad, isolative, repetitive- Fuck it up! Yeah, all that aside, it never borders on dehumanizing. That I think is a factor I don't actually hear being talked about, at least as much. When it comes to perverts, degenerates, kinks, fetishes, whatever, it's sort of the popular thing to both shame and dehumanize and or overglorify it, both in terms of how certain characters enforce it on others, as well as make said characters lack redeeming qualities next to how deplorable they are. Akihito, 
is the antithesis of this understanding. Being that, yeah, he's got a fish for girls and glasses, but he's also a fucking person. He goes off about certain fantasies, sure, but he never stoops to enforcing his fish on other girls. It's mainly all in his head. Which is a lot more tame, considering. Next to him, Mirai Kuriyama is an introverted klutz, but in the same vein as Akihiko, that's not her whole character. A lot of her introverted tendencies come from her trauma and self-deprecation. Which is another thing. I think there are people <coughs> that tend to have this misconception about being an introvert and how just not liking people or being a shut-in is all it takes, but as someone who okay, well, still kind of is, honestly, being an introvert tends to be a problem for a lot of people, being that many of us want to be around others and socialize and make friends, but past experiences tend to make that very hard. Kuriyama is an example of this. She's ostracized due to her blood and the amount of traumatic events that she's lived through, making her hesitant in a number of ways. But she's not such a lone wolf that it's all there is to her character. She tends to be more thinking in the short term, or even going off of what's in front of her. She's caring about others, has a decent sense of humor, has an interest in bonsai. Good god, why does it sound like I'm trying to sell her off? Of Mirai Kuriyama today. She got to fluffy hands, submissive and breathable, and more trauma than the saliva of the Holocaust. All that and more for the lowest payment of 29 dollars 99 This is all separately. Let's jump into some backup. FBI? Him. There he is. Playing too much of that GTA. Playing too much of that duck to the drain. Which will get the gun from A. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Kuriyama is in a corporate cutout. <laughs> Other characters. Hiromi Nase is a character that comes off as the strong, silent, cool headed fighter. But in reality, he's got a thing for his sister. Yeah, if you thought Akihiko going off about girls wearing glasses was gross, try a guy whose most of his conversations have him talking about how much he's into blood related sisters. Especially his own as he gets off on him being called Big Brother by her. Big Brother, I love you. Big Brother, I love you. Hello there. Change that ringtone. Immediately. And while that's not his whole character, as he does contribute more to the story, in comparison, Akihito is a better example of having a specific interest that isn't... gross. Not to mention, yeah, pretty much Hiromi is Shin for this. Which is something indeed. There's a lot more characters in the series I could talk about and all, like Yayoi, but... Akun, have you been doing awesome? It's your mommy! I think you get the point. This isn't just your atypical slice-of-life rom-com meets Double May Cry. No, it's its own story, like, with characters, and people, and someone who wrote it. And that's... You know, that's good. Yeah. Yes, I studied under the US education system, can you tell? But alright, let's move on. The story, despite how I mentioned how by the numbers it is, is actually pretty investing. The world isn't... Actually, scratch that, the world is pretty damn interesting. Having cursed spirits roam around, mixed with them being an occupation for warriors and spirits to tackle, and uh, special dungeons that, you know, mix real-world illusions onto itself, that's actually kinda cool. Like, this would be a fun game to play, right? Right? This would be a fun game to play, right? Right? But next to the world, to me, it's gotta have likable characters. And next to some of the comedy being the most well-timed and well-written, how'd you reach that conclusion? How could you? you? The characters are pretty interesting. And the dub is, I mean, it's Kyoto animation. I don't know what it is, but a lot of the dub casting, I mean, it's not like it's bad, but it feels mostly off. But in its defense, it has moments like this, so... I had her put them on when we were in the club room, alone. Actually, it might be more accurate to say she couldn't resist putting them on. Somewhere down the line, she even started to enjoy herself. Hey! What have I told you kids about playing baseball already? If I remember right, Kuriyama told me she's a horrible singer. Aki. Hmm? It's too late. <laughs> Oh, 
Characters go a long way in how enjoyable the series is to me. There's playful banter between them, but there's also moments that showcase what they're really like outside of what you'd normally see them as. For the amount of series and even films that try to do this and come up short, or do it wrong in a number of ways, the series I actually think pulls it off fairly well. Like for instance, Akihito may be a pervert infatuated with girls and glasses, through that, it's led to him having an encounter after encounter with a girl who he gets to know personally. Both Mirai and Akihito have misunderstandings of their situations, Mirai especially, but after it's cleared, you can tell both of them actually care more for one another instead of it simply being her trying to kill the immortal. And even that comes into play. And that's not even mentioning the story in the movie. Speaking of, let's, talk, let's actually talk about the story. I feel like we've been here before. Have we been here before? Well, some of it consists of the Monster of the Week type deal. Most of it is, well, nothing new. Oh my god, this is happening again! It is on paper what many other series in the same vein have done before, and in some respects more interestingly. In practice, however, the story is nothing without the world and characters, and I honestly do think they go a long way. A story around grief and revenge wouldn't have been as investing if it didn't have a world like this or characters like this. Sometimes both. A story around two ostracized lovebirds going from enemies to friends to a couple wouldn't have been as effective if their arcs weren't done justice. To top all of that off, is the animation. Alright, so I want to do something a little different here than what I usually do, because there's an elephant in the room that we gotta address. And yeah, it unfortunately is related to Kyokai no Kanta. The anime adaptation of Kyokai no Kanta, the story written and illustrated by Nagamo Tori and Chisei Kamui respectively, was directed and written by Taichi Irate and Juki Hanada, also respectfully. The animation directors for this anime consisted of Miku Kadawaki, Nao Naito, Shoko Ikeda, Chiyoko Ueno, Nobuaki Maruki, Yukiko Horiguchi, and Kayo Hikiyama. And one of the directors and storyboard artists for the show and key animators for the second and last film of the series was Yasushiro Takemoto, who's also worked on Amagi, Brilliant Park, Hyoka, Lucky Star, Haruhi Suzumiya, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, Keion, Tamago Market, Hibiki Euphonium, Nishijo, Violet Evergarden, and Tenshi Muyo in Love. I know, for many people, listing off what you see in the end credits is boring and uninteresting. Generally, this is why, when it comes to the art and animation and the fiction I talk about, I generalize and say it's honestly well done and give praise to some of the work's best moments but I felt it right here. It's no secret by now, and if you already knew, you probably also understand where I'm coming from with this part of the vid. To those that don't know, Kyoto Animation back in 2019 undergone one of the worst moments in the studio's history, with an arson attack that killed 36 people, one of which being Yasushiro Takimoto, the director I just mentioned. However, as a silver lining, there is some news that came out this year around the attack. The culprit, Shinji Aba, who claimed his motive was a grudge due to the studio plagiarizing his novel ideas that they rejected in an annual contest, which the court did not find any evidence of this. In January of 2024, this year currently, he was sentenced to death. I know saying this or this actually happening won't fix anything. It's not going to bring the dead back to life or turn the clock back to before the moment happened, which, you know, if it did, we might have prevented a lot of shit from happening. But, as someone who has a long-term love for this studio and what they've released, this was at least somewhat of a silver lining to hear about for me. The people who made all these wonderful shows, including Kyokai no Kanta, and made plenty of memories to this day, have been affected personally. But it is good to know, despite what had happened, the studio is still continuing to make works. Hopefully they'll be able to keep going, but if not, I'm just glad we got what we did. The animation in Kyokai no Kanta is beautiful. You don't need me to tell you that. From the scenery, to the sakuga, to the comedy, to the smaller moments. I've always been impressed, or at least entertained, by the studio's works, and this was in no way an exception. Kyokai no Kanta is a classic in many ways. From the animation, to the world it's created, to the story it utilizes, to the characters. By all accounts, it is an all-around well-crafted work of art. If you haven't given it a shot, or you have, but it's been so long, I recommend looking at it after all these years. 
It's a pleasant romance story, and sometimes something as simple as that is all you need.